Hey everyone, this lesson is on autoimmune hemolytic anemia. In this lesson, we're talking about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about three different types of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and we're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms of each and how we can make the diagnosis and how we can treat them. So autoimmune hemolytic anemia is a hematologic condition due to autoantibodies against red blood cell or RBC membrane antigen or multiple antigens that cause the red blood cell to hemolyze and causes anemia after prolonged hemolysis. So it is a type of hemolytic anemia, but it is an autoimmune cause to the hemolytic anemia. So I have an entire lesson on hemolytic anemia and what to look for and what causes hemolytic anemia. So please check out that lesson for more details. So hemolytic anemia is a anemia, so a low hemoglobin caused by red blood cell hemolysis. But in this instance, it's autoimmune, which means that there are autoantibodies causing red blood cell destruction. So this is the key to these conditions. So hemolytic anemia is a generic term and there are many conditions that cause hemolytic anemia. There are a large group of non-immune causes and the non-immune causes also have subcategories of causes. So membrane causes, hemoglobin causes, and enzyme causes. And I have several lessons on many of these topics, so please check out those lessons. And then on the other side, we have immune causes. And we can split this up into alloimmune, so these are from transfusion reactions and then there's autoimmune and this is where our lesson is going to focus on and there are three conditions in general that I want to talk about warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria so the subtypes we're going to talk about these subtypes more specifically in the next couple of slides so the first one is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia so warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is the most common type of autoimmune hemolysis or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of cases and it is caused by an immunoglobulin G autoantibody. So that's very important. IgG is the culprit in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia and it binds to membranes of erythrocytes around 37 degrees. So the basal body temperature and it causes an extra vascular hemolysis and it can lead to splenomegaly. So these are all very important key points with regards to warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Now there are several causes of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The first one is primary or idiopathic. There is no obvious secondary cause causing this condition. It is just a condition on its own. But there are several secondary causes that can cause this condition. Malignancies are a big one. Malignancies including Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemias like CLL, and ovarian tumors. Other autoimmune conditions can also cause a secondary warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And these include lupus and ulcerative colitis. Medications can lead to this condition. And one one in particular that I want you to remember is alpha methyl dopa. And some viral infections can lead to warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and these are more of a common cause in children. So these are the subcategory of causes of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But what I want you to take away from this slide is that it is the most common autoimmune hemolytic anemia that's caused by an IgG autoantibody that causes extravascular hemolysis and splenomegaly. The second subtype of autoimmune hemolytic anemia is cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And it is due to an IgM autoantibody that binds preferentially to erythrocyte membranes at temperatures between 0 degrees and 5 degrees Celsius. So this is why it's called cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The autoantibodies bind the best at these colder temperatures. And it is IgM. So very important. Cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia is an IgM autoantibody. And it causes complement activation and intravascular hemolysis. So it leads to sequestration in the liver. So as opposed to warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which causes an extravascular hemolysis, cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia causes an intravascular hemolysis. So cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia has several causes as well. The first one is idiopathic. There is no known cause, and this is more typical in elderly patients. The other ones are infectious, and the infections that you need to remember for cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia are mycoplasma pneumonia, and mononucleosis. So easy to remember here, IgM is the autoantibody in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So IgM and the infections are mycoplasma. So an M in mycoplasma pneumonia and M in mononucleosis. And the other one that can cause cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia is chickenpox. But the ones I really want you to take from this are mycoplasma pneumonia and mononucleosis. And it goes well with the IgM autoantibody to help us remember. So again, cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia 
hypoglycemia, IgM autoantibody that binds preferentially at colder temperatures, so zero degrees and five degrees Celsius, so hemolysis occurs at these temperatures, and you get complement activation in intravascular hemolysis, and the causes, again, are idiopathic and infectious. The last subtype is proxismal cold hemoglobinuria. Proxismal cold hemoglobinuria is also known as Donath Land Steiner syndrome. It's a very rare autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's the least common of the three, and it's more common in children. So what happens in this condition is that when it's cold, there's binding of autoantibodies to the red blood cell membranes, and it fixes complement when it's cold. And then when it's warm, it causes an intravascular hemolysis. So this is why it's called paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. You need both cold and warm temperatures. So when it's cold, you don't have the hemolysis, but you do have the fixing of complement and the binding of autoantibodies. So we need the cold temperature, but then we also need the warm temperature, which then leads to the intravascular hemolysis. So as opposed to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, where we just need cold temperatures to have hemolysis, proximal cold hemoglobinuria needs both. You need to have the cold temperatures to allow binding of autoantibodies to red blood cell membranes and fixing of complement, and then the warming of temperatures to cause that intravascular hemolysis. So that's the difference with this condition. And what are some of the causes of proximal cold hemoglobinuria? So viral infections are another key one here, and this seems to be upper respiratory tract infection infections, and it's mostly what causes proxismal cold hemoglobinuria in children. And there is syphilis. So syphilis seems to be a cause as well. And this generally is congenital or tertiary syphilis. So either you're born with the syphilis due to syphilitic infections during pregnancy, or you have an advanced stage of syphilis leading to proxismal cold hemoglobinuria. So these are the two causes that you want to think about for proxismal cold hemoglobinuria. So again, what I want you to take from this slide is that it's very rare autoimmune hemolytic anemia that's most common in children and it's need you need both cold and warm temperatures for hemolysis so cold temperatures for the binding of the auto antibodies to red blood cell membranes and fixing of complement and warm temperatures that lead to intravascular hemolysis so what are some of the clinical findings of autoimmune hemolytic anemia there are several clinical features that are similar among the three subtypes and there's a couple that are more specific for certain subtypes of autoimmune hemolytic anemia so hemolysis again is the most common across the three because it leads to hemolysis. So here is just a picture of what happens in hemolysis. So if we have an erythrocyte, it breaks down. We have lactate dehydrogenase increase. We have hemoglobin increase. And then the hemoglobin can be further broken down into other subcomponents. The hemoglobin itself is bound to haptoglobin. The heme can then lead to bilirubin production. So this is why we see increased bilirubin, decreased free haptoglobin, and increased LDH in any cause of hemolysis. So this is the main reason. In autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it is a normocytic anemia. So MCV numbers are within the normal range. And with any anemia, we see signs and symptoms of anemia. Pallor, so they're very pale, they're fatigued, and they may have dyspnea or shortness of breath. And there's a bunch of other symptoms of anemia as well. Jaundice is also another clinical finding or feature in autoimmune hemolytic anemia because of the increased bilirubin due to hemolysis. And as mentioned before, splenomegaly. And splenomegaly is more particularly common in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So there are other clinical features that I haven't mentioned here that we see in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia in particular. And some of these include cold-induced phenomenon like Raynaud's phenomenon. So a lot of this is similar across all autoimmune hemolytic anemias, but with regards to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, you also may see Raynaud's phenomenon. And with proxismal cold hemoglobinuria, we may see constitutional symptoms. So constitutional symptoms like fever and chills, aches and pains, headaches. And in the name itself, proxismal cold hemoglobinuria, we see hemoglobinuria. So hemoglobin in the urine. So very darkened color urine during these paroxysms or during these attacks when there is cold temperatures and rewarming, we can see some of these symptoms. So that is proxismal cold hemoglobinuria. You may also see hemoglobinuria in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia as well. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat these conditions. The diagnosis is based on a lot of lab work we talked about before. We see evidence of hemolysis, so increased bilirubin, increased lactate dehydrogenase, and decreased free haptoglobin. But then you want to go a step further, and we got to do a direct Coombs test. And the direct Coombs test is positive in autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And we got to go a step further to differentiate each of these. So warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we see IgG-coated red blood cells. So seeing IgG-coated red blood cells is the diagnosis of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And we can also see spherocytes in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia as well under a blood smear. 
term. So here is spherocytes. So these couple here. And for cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we see complement coated red blood cells. And that is how we make the diagnosis of cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And making the diagnosis of paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria can rely on these tests as well, along with some of the clinical features that we've talked about earlier. So how do we treat it? So treatment is often supportive. Unless they have very severe symptoms, severe anemia, then it's an often supportive treatment. So with regards to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, we want to avoid cold temperatures. And that's the mainstay of supportive treatment. We want to try to prevent any episodes of hemolysis. With regards to severe warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, well, we can't avoid the warmth. So how do we treat this? So when it's severe, when there's severe anemia, when there's severe symptoms, we can use glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are first line treatment. Can also do a splenectomy. Splenectomy actually remove the spleen. And we can have immunosuppressive treatments like azathioprine or rituximab. And folic acid supplementation can also be used as a long-term management to maintain folic acid supplies in the body and lead to increased erythrocyte count and increased blood counts. And in some cases, we may need a red blood cell transfusion. With regards to severe cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, essentially the same. So we want to still try to avoid cold temperatures. This is, again, the mainstay of preventing these episodes of hemolysis. And then if there is severe anemia, we use red blood cell transfusion. So again, and what comes from this is that severe cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia and proxismal cold hemoglobinuria, a lot of it is preventing episodes of hemolysis. So you want to avoid cold exposure. And in severe cases, we want to use transfusions. But with regards to severe warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it's more difficult. We can't avoid warm temperatures. So a lot of it has to do with suppressing the immune system. Glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids are first line treatment. We can use splenectomy because there's extra vascular hemolysis in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And and other than that, we can use other immunosuppressive treatments like azathioprine. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If you want to learn more about other types of hemolytic anemias, please check out my lessons on those topics. I have many lessons in my hematology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.